Hi, podcast listeners. Welcome to the A World of Difference podcast. We have so many guests on this show making a difference in our lives, making a difference all around the world with the expertise that they bring. And yet so many of you are reaching out to me saying, you want more. It's not enough just what we're putting on these podcast episodes for you. And so I am here to extend a very warm welcome to you to our Difference Maker community where you can join for as little as $5 a month to get all this extra content out the gate, you're going to get 30 plus mini sods of exclusive content not available for the regular podcast listeners and an exclusive mini sode every month. And you'll get exclusive voting power to help us pick podcast topics and more. And that's with our changers tier. There's three different main tiers and then an extra uh, larger tier. But whatever tier that you join at, you will be included in this extra content and I know that many of you are wanting to go a little bit deeper. And so even though it gets a little wild in there sometimes because of how deep we go, I want you to join us there. This extra content is very special. It means a great deal to me to be a part of this community with you. And I would love to just exchange uh, ideas or perspectives that you have around these different episodes. And that's the place where we do it. So please show up to our Difference Maker community. Give us $5 out of your pocket every month. And I think that you'll have a lot of fun in there because we do. And I would love for you to join us. So go to patreon.com slash a world of difference to join us there. Welcome to the A World of Difference podcast. I'm Lori Adams Brown, and this is a podcast for those who are different and want to make a difference. Most popular episodes of 2022 is with Dr. Wade Mullen. I know many of you are not shocked about this because many of you listened and engaged with this episode, downloaded it, shared it with friends. Many of you have already been a huge um, proponent of Dr. Wade Mullen's work. Many of you, especially in the abuse community within faith based spaces, but also just in the academic spaces as well. Dr. Wade Mullen is the author of the very popular and widely read book, Something's Not Right, Decoding the Hidden Tactics of Abuse and Freeing Yourself from Its Power. As you'll remember when he came on the episode, he's not only a world-renowned expert on abuse in the church, but he also served 10 years in pastoral ministry and then five years as a seminary MDiv program director. He was assistant professor before transitioning to basically his full-time research, writing, consulting, speaking advocacy role that he's been doing lately. And his PhD, many of you have read his dissertation. Um, he got his PhD in leadership studies, and his dissertation is titled Impression Management Strategies Used by Evangelical Organizations in the Wake of an Image-Threatening Event. And this is where many of you have engaged with his work. Also, he's very widely known for his work with Grace, which is an organization that goes into churches to evaluate and help churches understand how abuse has occurred, whether it has occurred, and how they can move forward in a healthier way. And he's been involved with them for a while and doing many wonderful things in terms of helping both survivors and churches and uh, faith-based communities understand where abuse has taken a foothold and what they can do together. I know his work has blessed many of you, and it was an honor to have him on the show last year after having read his book, um, shortly after I realized I had been spiritually abused and then after calling it out in my church had been terminated along with my husband for just speaking those words, um, abuse basically was not a, a, a word that was wanted to be heard. And so I know many of you have had that same experience. Um, and Dr. Mullen comes at it from an academic approach, but also someone who's worked within the church and taught you know, seminary for many years. His heart is for the church to flourish, for the whole community, not just Christendom or Christianity per se, um, but the the pureness of the church with the flourishing that was intended and is still intended for all of those who believe and follow a God who is loved. So it is an honor once again to rebroadcast this episode with Dr. Wade Mullen to allow his words of wisdom, of academia, of personal experience, and a vast amount of research to bless you in ways that help you have eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts and minds that are open, hands and feet that are ready to take action on what we hear. 
Um, and I think many of you will resonate with the title of his book, which really grabbed me, which is something's not right. And I know many of you have said that even maybe recently in your faith-based spaces or a while ago, and you still can't quite figure it out. If you're in a space of confusion, of trying to figure out why something's being said from one person and something's being said that's very different in the wake of an image management event, then uh, maybe this episode is for you. Maybe you're listening to it again for a reason. And once again, just a trigger warning that we will be discussing content around abuse. If you've experienced abuse of any kind, spiritual abuse, psychological abuse, emotional abuse, financial abuse, um, domestic violence of any kind, anything that would be triggering to you. I just want to give you the freedom to not listen today or take a break or do anything that would help your body to feel safe as you work through the trauma of your own experience. We um, most of all just want to care for you. And this episode is here if and when you are ever ready for it, or if you need to take it in chunks, that's okay too. Just whatever you need to stay grounded and feel safe today as you listen to this or don't. And also, if you know anyone who could benefit from this, ask them to join in with you. This is very important content. Once again, happy to reintroduce to you Dr. Wade Mullen. Dr. Wade Mullen, oh, it's so exciting to have you on the podcast talking about your book and your work today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, thanks, Lori. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to, to, to be on the show with you. Well, I mean, you have no idea what an honor it is for me and our listeners around the world who have interacted with your book and your newsletter and just um, have seen you speak at conferences and um, watch videos of what you're saying. You're such a thought leader around abuse, especially abuse in the church. And so I'm really excited to talk about what is something nobody ever wants to talk about, um, but just in the nature of exposing what's really there and helping us understand how to navigate something that's very dark and horrible. And um, I just, I wonder, did you ever imagine you would be the kind of person who would be analyzing nearly a thousand cases of clergy abuse over five years? And what led you to do this kind of research? No, I never imagined it. Um, never set out uh, to to be in this field and to do this kind of work. Um, it is something that found me um, in a way, and it was through experiences at a local church and then through pursuing a, a PhD and doing a doctoral study on how Christian organizations use impression management strategies in the wake of a crisis, a scandal, an image-threatening event. It was through those twin experiences that I found myself linked to to these stories and I of course didn't know um, how how prevalent abuse is in Christian circles in our churches wasn't aware of the severity of the the harm and the trauma and and the extent of the cover-up and it was all just very eye-opening and disillusioning and I when I kind of walked through that and got to the other side wanted to put it behind me in many ways and at different points when I was going through the 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 PhD work and collecting all these cases just asking myself you know why why am I doing this um and wanted to give up because it's it was just very difficult and I had a therapist at the time Mm -hmm. who who challenged challenged me at different points to stick stick with it and asked me a question that has stuck with me um she said you're 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 linked to this now. Uh, you're linked to the mm. the stories of survivors. Um, you're linked to this academic research. What are you going to do with that link? And and so that's a that's a question that I've wrestled with since and decided at that point. Well, I'm not going to just bury that link and walk away from it. I'm going to try to turn it into something meaningful that can be a gift to others. And so that's. So no, I didn't. It's a long answer to say no. I, I didn't set out to do this, um, but here I am, and hopefully, um, st- stewarding kind of those experiences and that learning well in a way that's helpful to others. Oh well, it certainly is. It's, it was very helpful to me, and 
your book, um, Something's Not Right, Decoding the Hidden Tactics of Abuse and Freeing Yourself from Its Power. It was the first book I read right after I had been fired for calling out abuse in my church. And it just was like, I was so thirsty (laughs) for something to help me understand. And I've heard that story from so many others, my husband included. We both read your book cover to cover and underlined so many parts of it. So quotable, the way you just word things. And um, yeah, like I I wanted to dig into this question first because I have an undergraduate degree in sociology. So when I read (laughs) the word, the name Irving Kaufman in your book, I remember in social theory in my class um, studying him as a social theorist and being very taken with his social theory. Um, It's very unusual, but it I love how you apply it to this framework. It's the perfect theory to have chosen to help us understand Um, because you referenced this, you know, you mentioned it earlier, this branch of sociology called impression management, um, which Irving Goffman, who's one of the leading proponents of symbolic interactionism, and he has this framework dramaturgy for everybody listening. If you're not familiar, I'll just get kind of synopsis of it, and then I'll get um, you to answer a question around it, Wade. Basically, um, Irving Goffman is saying, you know, people – Uh, we portray people as actors on a stage and their actions are shaped by the type of interaction they make with others. And so he has this, his best known work is the presentation of self in everyday life where human interaction is mediated by the use of symbols, by interpretation or ascertaining the meaning of one another's actions. And this is so critical for the, (laughs) for church abuse conversations because Goffman's framework shows us that social life is grounded on this sort of cutoff between the front and the backstage Um, And Goffman alludes that the public audience hardly has any access to the backstage and vice versa, right? So, you know, there's there's a lot of talk about celebrity pastors nowadays. I think we can imagine the stage in a lot of churches because a lot of churches actually literally have stages nowadays. And so my question for you, Wade, around this whole concept is how are we um, to look at the stage in the church compared, you know, with celebrity pastors, like I mentioned, where abuse can be this dark secret behind the curtain, and how can this whole framework help us understand what we're not seeing and what we're not supposed to see? So walk us through that and why that was a, an impactful theory for you to look at. I think I would start by mentioning how when you're in a toxic, abusive environment, uh, gaslighting is such a common feature of that. And so your perception mm-hmm. of you know to be true and real is is distorted in order to confuse you because when people are confused that it's easier for them to be controlled and and so what's 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 needed is is a lens a pair of glasses that will help you to see uh, what's what's going on and and what I found in Irving Goffman's work and the field of impression management and organizational impression management is a framework or a lens through which you can view just about any social social system, any social s- situation, and so that that metaphor of the theater play I think is, a, is is a great metaphor that can be applied to so many different areas of our lives. But I think it has particular uh, application in a way that's uniquely helpful to a church situation um, because you have in in, in a very real sense, actors on a stage. You have people in positions of trust who are performing for an audience. And there are so many different, I think, dynamics that are at play that when you look at that through the lens of impression management theory, dramaturgical theory, through the lens of a theater play in that in that metaphor, I think it allows you to see so much that otherwise you wouldn't be able to see. And then that, that brings clarity, that brings vo- vocabulary, that brings language, which can be really useful to help you gain, again, a, an accurate view of the situation, what you've experienced, so you can actually begin to call it for what it is and describe it to others. And, and so that's, you know, that, that's, that's one way in which I found it to be really helpful to me personally as I was going through this so that I could say, here's what I think is going on and call it out and name it. Um, but also in helping other people understand the situation that they're in, I found it to be a really helpful f- um, f- framework. Yes, I do too. So helpful. Even you have an illustration in the book of a stage and you show the pictures of what this can look like. And I, I just, 
I think language, you mentioned that that's how you start off the book, and we'll get into language in a second, but it is so helpful for us to understand through this framework. Um, But defining abuse, I would say in my experience and the aftermath of my own spiritual abuse and psychological abuse at a church um, is something we don't do very well. (laughs) Um, And so you say in your book, when someone treats you as an object, they are willing to harm for their own benefit. Abuse has occurred and that person has become an abuser. So help us understand, because we often sugarcoat this in the church, what abuse actually is. Yeah, and I think there are many different definitions of abuse, and that's partly because abuse is is complex in the in the sense that it can it can show up in a variety of different ways. It can show up in a variety of different contexts. But when um, I describe abuse in in those terms, I'm thinking about a person, the way in which a person who is abusive views others as objects and then treats people as objects uh, that can be manipulated, that can be coerced for their own benefit. You know, so there is a, there is a purpose behind it. And, and, and I think when you, when you are looking at an abusive situation or an abusive relationship, it's important to, to, to think in systems, um, to, to recognize that there are multiple things going on. And, and sometimes it's, it's hard to identify, you know, for example, the, the language that is being used that might reveal that somebody is being coerced and manipulated, that might give you an indication that this person is being viewed and treated as an object. And then it's even more difficult to discern what the purpose of that person is who's using that language, um, whether or not they actually do see this other person as an object to be, to be used. And, and so it's, it's, it's beyond, I guess what I would point out is it is, it is beyond a, a, an episode or an incident. And it, it takes a view that sees the, the, what's going on in between people in that in that relationship in that system the communication itself what's going on inside of people and of course that can be very difficult to discern and then recognizing what is what is happening as a result of that you know so so when I describe a, a situation or a relationship or a person as abusive I'm not so much thinking about an abusive event or episode, although that that does happen, but what what is happening before and after that? Because the the, the real factor that remains constant beyond the episode and in between the episodes is 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 the fear, is the sense of captivity, is the is, is 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 the confusion, is the feeling of being disempowered and this kind of realization that people have that maybe I am being viewed and treated as an object. Um, so, so that's a, it's, when I think about abuse, there's, there's multiple layers, I guess, is, is, is what I would say needs to mm-hmm. come into view. Yeah, that's, that's really good. You mentioned in your book um, that some of the worst forms of abuse are psychological, actually. And I don't think this is what the average person thinks. I don't think that's what I used to think either. Um, Because I think we have sort of a hierarchy in our head, like sexual abuse, physical abuse, definitely like so much worse. Help us understand why psychological abuse is so damaging, though. Because I think it, 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 it robs you of your uh, sense of meeting, um, your sense of self-worth your your dignity it it erodes your identity you know so these are things that are very important to us um these are these are soul level stuff and and it it is a it is a wound that may not uh, be so easily uh, diagnosed uh, because it's at the level of the, the psyche, the soul, it's your, it's your inner person uh, that's being stalked, that's being viewed as an object, that's being harassed and manipulated. 
And, and that may not, the, the wounds that exist there may not be evident to people who are looking at the situation or looking at your experience. But it's, it's, I think that adds to the wounding um, because then you find that it's hard to communicate to other people what you've experienced. It's, it's, you might find it difficult to, for other people to believe you. Um, so it just, it adds to the confusion. It adds to the feeling of being trapped. It adds to the, um, to the betrayal that you experience from others uh, who might otherwise come to your aid if they more easily saw the wound. And so, so it's, it's, it's deeper, it's longer lasting. Um, and it is, it is, um, how, how do I want to say this? Um, it, I think it, it brings this, this sense of being in a, in a psychic prison, this sense of being in mm. a, in, in a trap. And that is a terrible place to be in because it's, it's like being in a, in a prison without physical walls and a prison without mm. physical bars. It still has that effect of, okay, I'm trapped in this. I don't know how to get out of this. I, it, it is having an impact on the whole of my life. I, it's, it's eroding me away, but it's invisible. Um, it's, it's there, but I can't get out of it and other people can't see it. So it's, it's a very hopeless kind of captive place to be in. Wow. That's a great description for somebody who's walked through psychological abuse. That is a great description. And I think that, um, it's so important to understand how you start the book off, which is what grabbed me so much in the beginning is about the language. Um, and so many of us coming out of an abusive situation don't even have language to describe it, but we've also often been abused with language. And you start off with the quote by Joseph Brodsky. And I have read this quote a million times and thought of it so often since you, since I read it in your book, but the quote is, you think evil is going to come into your houses wearing big black boots, but it doesn't come in like that look at the language it begins in the language and so you kind of unpack that in your book about how you say words lead to confusion and captivity so would you unpack that a little bit more what is it um, about language that confuses us and holds us captive for those who can't quite see that yet i i think again um when you're talking about an abusive system relationship person there is the language itself, um, but behind that language is a is a purpose um, that is kept hidden. You know, there's a hidden goal, there's a hidden agenda that's informing that communication that you're receiving. You may not be aware of the purpose, the hidden commitment, the hidden goal that's viewing you as an object. But the communication, though, is going to... Um, be used in a way that usually coerces some kind of trust. So when I when I talk about um, evil, you know, showing up first in language and Joseph Brodsky, you know, using that um, to help us understand that this is the way in which it enters into your world is through language. I think it shows up um, in the ways in which abusive people talk about themselves you know, through self-promoting language, grandiose statements. That's where you might see, you know, narcissistic kind of uh, language that's self-promoting. But what's the purpose of that? You know, it's, it, it might be in order to get other people to, 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 to trust. Um, hey, here's somebody who is clearly successful, knows what they're doing, and they're, they're volunteering this information. And, I'm hearing this and it's, it's giving me this sense of confidence in this person. Right. But then that might then, um, turn into other promoting language, you know, so the, the ways in which that person promotes themselves and the, and the language that they use, the words they use might then be directed at, at you in order to charm you in order to make you feel as if you're being promoted in, you, you know, so your successes are highlighted and exaggerated and, Basically, you're being flattered, you're, you're being complimented, 
And then along with that, you know, there, there might be nonverbal language, uh, gift giving communicates something, um, shows of affection, it communicates something. And when it's, when that communication is in, is in the hands of somebody who's viewing as an object and their purpose is to get something from you, to disempower you so they can dispossess you of something that you have that they want, then that language is actually being used to deceive you by getting you to trust that person, but it's all a trap. So they've laid a net using this flowery language, using this self-promoting talk. They've laid a net so that you, you don't know that what you're walking into is a trap. It, I, so I use the image of a garden often uh, that somebody who's using this kind of language is creating this, 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 this garden experience so they are leading other people to enter into this garden and giving this, this impression that the experience is going to be one, of, one of, um, of, of charm and joy and happiness and, and pleasant. It's all, going, it, it's all pleasant. But, and, and, but what, what is below the surface that you don't know is, is a pit. And at some point, the, the ground below you gives out and you find yourself no longer in this garden, but you find yourself in this, in this pit that you didn't know was there. And now you're, you're confused, you're held captive, you're surrounded by, by, by walls. And so the language, in a sense, is kind of the way it usually shows up, is in this ingratiating talk, in this self-promoting talk, that draws people into this garden. And people aren't, don't realize that perhaps behind that language is a is a is a purpose and that purpose then only reveals itself when some people usually not everyone but some people find themselves all of a sudden in this pit below the garden Hmm. yeah that's that's a good illustration i've heard you say that yeah no it's very very helpful because i think that's part of the cognitive dissonance people expect abusers to be all bad or the abusive system to be all bad and it's never that way or you would never walk into it But um, I think that one of the things that makes it hard is in the aftermath of abuse, there's a lot of um, need for those who've had this kind of, you know, religious trauma, spiritual abuse, psychological abuse, whatever form of abuse they've endured to make sense of it all, this whole sense-making concept that you talk about too in your book. And and yet in religious environments, in Christianity in particular, churches will often shut down survivors' voices by calling it gossip when they're trying just to process what happened with others and process the language and process that garden being laid and that they were in a tra- they're trying to process it and they're told they're gossiping. Um, how does this continue to wound and traumatize and even abuse survivors when they're just trying to thrive and flourish in the aftermath? Well, it, it, it keeps them from being able to experience um, recovery. You know, if they're, if they're already in a toxic situation, an abusive situation, where um, there are um, rules against uh, gossip, and there's typically in those situations a, a lot of rules, a lot of unstated expectations, so people don't know when they're crossing a line or not. So they're in this kind of system where they're wrapped in, 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 in constraint and, and they feel like they're always walking on a razor's edge. So they've, they've likely, even if they haven't identified it, already experienced, experienced harm, have already been viewed and treated as an object. And it, it then... I. Th- what I see, um, a, one of the purposes of that toxic organization, that abusive organization, the abusive leader, is to keep people from telling their, their stories, is to disconnect them from people who might provide understanding and provide support. So these are silencing measures, which is the opposite of what people need who have been harmed, who have been mistreated in order to recover. Um, They need safety. They need to be able to tell uh, their story and their experience to to others who might be able to validate that, affirm that, uh, disentangle all the confusion and all the gaslighting. 
So sometimes these rules are in place and they, and they have the effect of casting a shadow over the, over the culture, over the organization. And one of the books that's been helpful to me um, is titled Meeting the Ethical Challenges of Leadership um, by Craig Johnson. And the subtitle I like, it's, the subtitle is Casting, casting Light or Shadow. And when ethical leaders cast light, then people don't feel as if they have to hold their stories and their experiences close to their chest. They don't have to keep secrets. They don't have to be afraid of expressing appropriate dissent. They don't have to worry about what, what's going to happen if they ask, ask a question or voice disagreement. But when leaders cast a shadow... The, the impact of that is that everybody then keeps everything close to them um, because they learn that if they, if they tell their story, if they speak out, if they, if they use their voice and their agency, it's going to result in further harm. So they live in these, in these shadows. And, and so, yeah, so the gossip um, and the emphasis on that when it's in toxic organizations, it's usually not well defined. Um, it's it's applied to to followers, but not to the leaders. So I've often seen that <laughs> leadership that is yep. you know trying to quell gossip, they themselves talk freely and very poorly about other people in their mm-hmm. absence. Um, so yeah, 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 definitely my experience, unfortunately, which is confusing. And part of what you say that language does is it's confusing you. And I was definitely a part of being confused by the fact that the lead pastor who was abusive toward me was like, you'll get fired for gossip. But he was constantly name calling and trashing other people to me and, you know, small behind this curtain type environments. It just is very confusing. Uh, but impression management is is a huge part of what's going on, right? That's what you talk about in the book. And so you you have I have this quote that you wrote in your book: the tactics of impression management used by organizations to cover up their wrongs are the same tactics used by everyday abusers throughout the world, and that have been used by evil powers throughout history. This is a mind blowing thing if you haven't seen it before. But I think once you see it, you see it, and you see it everywhere it's being used. So for those who don't see it yet, could you walk us through the similarities between what might be happening in a, you know, an abusive church situation and what has happened with evil powers around the world? How are there similar tactics they're using? Yeah, and I, and I came to that realization after uh, walking through the Bible and identifying these impression management tactics that I saw throughout the Bible, um, looking at narratives from history um, of dictatorial leaders and and all kinds of abuses, and then primarily though looking at all of these cases of of pastors within the United States who have been arrested for some kind of crime over the past five years or so, and and realizing that the the same impression management tactics that organizations might use to save face and to and, and to get through a scandal and to basically manipulate people into maintaining their loyalty and their followership are the same tactics that individuals use um, in cases of all kinds of abuse. And so you see a lot of overlap um, between um, organizations and individuals that are abusive who use self-promoting talk and other promoting talk in order to coerce trust. And then once trust is coerced, you see this kind of language that begins to dismantle uh, someone's external world and begins to tell, let's say in an organizational setting, members uh, not to read certain books, uh, not to trust certain voices, um, not to um, go to therapy, right? So there, see, so but you also see that at the individual level, where in an individual, in, in an abusive relationship uh, between one person and another, the abusive person might begin to, in the course of the relationship, cut that person off from friends and family members, 
then there's this dismantling of someone's internal world. And I think you can see that at an organizational level where people are being taught then to, uh, followers in a church are being taught not to trust um, their, their own beliefs, uh, not, to, uh, not to have any kind of confidence in their own values that they brought into the, in, in, into the organization or into the church. And you see that at the individual level too. So you, there's all this overlap then even in the ways in which people are being, being dismantled um, but then in that place of dismantling, then often this is where people experience um, the, 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 the worst kind of harm because they've been dismantled. They've of, often been isolated through uh, the ways in which trust is coerced. And then the abusive institution or the abusive person acts in ways that are intimidating, acts in ways that are threatening, uses fear and power to control people. Uh, to ask them, to coerce them into doing things that they wouldn't otherwise do. And, and, and then from there, there's this silencing that happens. Okay, now somebody, there's, bound, there's boundary crossing behavior. There's someone who's been victimized. They have a story. And there's a need to make sure that that person doesn't tell anyone else. So the silencing tactics that organizations use to silence followers um, are very similar to the silencing tactics individual perpetrators use to silence those they've they've victimized and then then you know then then there's the ways in which people and organizations use defensive tactics to try to escape accountability when a story does come out or when they're confronted and so i show how can I, all these tactics throughout the book are, are described but mm-hmm. a, a light bulb moment for me was seeing how there's such similarity between the ways in which organizations use these kind of impression management tactics over time and in a way that reveals itself as a pattern and how individual abusers use many of the same kinds of tactics and in the same kind of way and in the same kinds of situational settings in order to in order to offend and in order to get away with that yeah it's so hard to see when you're in it i think that's the hard part but once you're on the outside, it's a little easier to, to see. But part of what happens is, like you mentioned, um, is the silence, right? So other people inside might be seeing their part, but they don't realize other people are experiencing it because of the silence. The, you'll get fired for gossip policy is mm-hmm. great in a tyrannical system to keep the narrative in your favor. So you, I have this quote from your book where you say, silence grants evil exactly what it needs to be effective. And you also say you must recognize that it is not just those doing the hiding that are who are at fault, but also those who benefit from the abuser's show and want it to continue. So, ouch for those of us who have been bystanders and not said anything, but maybe help us understand the dangers of the complicity that we can be a part of and that by being a silent bystander, we're on this, you know, performance team that Irvin Goffman calls it. Yeah, and... And it, and it is an ouch, you know, because it, it can be difficult to kind of step back and from this balcony perspective, uh, look at uh, maybe your, your prior role in a system like that and, and how you may have contributed just by um, at one point being sincerely converted to the system and to the way in which it did things or even if you weren't sincerely converted uh, you are remaining compliant. So that's even using some of Goffman's uh, language in his book, Asylum. But one thing that I will mention, though, is that the often those who are in those settings and they aren't speaking out, it's because they've been silenced, right? Um, and I think it's important primarily for those who are in positions of authority and responsibility, who are bystanders in the sense that they perhaps are members of the board or they are staff, they, are, um, they have access to the abusive leader, and they, they choose to stand by and to give passage to the abuse because, and there may be all different reasons for this, but 
they don't they choose maybe not to believe uh, what they've heard or what they see, or they choose to protect themselves. They choose to, uh, in some cases, uh, enable the abuse because they benefit. And this is what I'm getting at in the book. They benefit in some way, maybe financially or. Uh, through reputation or through their own access to power, they benefit in some way um, by the performance, uh, by the abusive leader's um, per- performance and actions and quote unquote success. And it's those people in particular uh, that I'd, I'm encouraging them to see the the damage that a silent bystander. Uh, can cause, not only in permitting that abuse safe passage, but also in communicating to those who have been harmed, to survivors, we don't believe you, or we do believe you, and your story just doesn't matter. Yeah, it's so true. And once you, if you've experienced abuse, and you've had people be silent, and um say well I've never experienced him that way or or the things that people might say or especially when they have seen it and they still choose not to speak that can be one of the most re-traumatizing things for people in a church environment in particular and I hear quite a bit about that and I've had my own experience with it it's so important for us to when you see something say something it's not easy to do but it's definitely a a clarion call we have right now for the church. Um, what what should we look for, though, to discern and stop abuse? For those who are saying, I want to help stop this, what should they look for? Because you say um, in the book, some have compared getting truth out of an abuser to nailing jello to a wall, because if they're caught, they'll use any tactic necessary to wiggle free, to evade accusation, to save face, to preserve their power and influence. So if pastors who abuse are so skilled at lying to evade these accusations and preserving their power at all costs, how can we find the truth and hold them accountable in order to protect others from being abused? That's a good question. I, I mean, I, I think you look for the deception uh, all throughout the, the, the pattern, and that can be difficult. But I think it, one thing you can do is take an inventory of uh, statements that you find to be um, an exaggeration of the truth or a mixing of truth and falsehood, uh, because sometimes it's just kind of like just right over that line. But it's enough to raise a flag in you like, well, I don't know that that's really true. You know, and, and so I recommend just take t- take note of that and then see if that deception shows up over time. And in a way that kind of looks like a pattern, um, see if that person is one way toward those they view as having less power than them. You know, maybe they're 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 more willing to display their anger, and they're more willing to be threatening and intimidating when they're meeting with people who have less power. But when they're meeting with mm-hmm. others who have more power, or let's say the the, the if it's a church, the, the congregation, they appear to be the exact opposite, right? So it's it's sort of this intimidation and this anger under control that's used as a weapon in certain mm. situations. Um, so you can look for those kind of things, and then even in that, um, look for the deception. So when somebody is seeking to control others through intimidation, through condemnation, through shaming them, often then there's deception that's even in that language. So they want somebody who's raising questions and is expressing dissent or sharing their story, speaking out. They, they, they want that person and other people to see that truth teller as either mad and irrational or bad in some way, uh, having some kind of character flaw or out for revenge. But there's a deception there often. There's things that are being said about that person that aren't true. Um, or maybe there's something in there that yeah might be connected to some kind of truth, but it's being blown up uh, out of proportion. So there's de- what I'm saying is that you can look for these these de- these deceptive tactics that are kind of attached to the communication in different situations across a a, a pattern. And then I would say how how does somebody respond, or how does an institution respond? 
when they don't get what they want, when mm-hmm. uh, when something they're trying to change fails, when when a goal they're trying to meet uh, it, when it doesn't happen, do they condemn other people? Do they blame other people? Do they become angry? Do they do they just try harder? Do they run people into the ground? How do they respond when people ask hard questions? How do they respond when 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 people speak up and dissent in a meeting? Do they do they pull you aside and say, you know, you shouldn't have said that in front of, you know, the team? You know, if you have a concern, just come to me, right? How, what do they do with messages that they don't want? Do they minimize those messages in ways that are coercive and manipulative? What do they do with that? So I think there's there's just questions you can ask and clues that you can look for that can help you discern whether or not a relationship or um, a, a system, an environment is abusive. That's very good. That's so good. I can see all of that in so many scenarios, including my own. Um, you know, I think what's hard is um, we are socialized to trust pastors, right? And we're socialized to believe they have our best interest in mind. And it feels wrong, like it's just us when we have those questions about a pastor. <clears throat> and I think, <clears throat> excuse me, you say in your book, the best places to hide are those least likely to be searched and among people least likely to suspect abuse. And so because we're socialized to trust pastors and believe pastors, especially these lead pastors of really large churches, because it seems like they're doing something right to grow a church this large. So maybe we're the wrong ones for questioning. So why is it that this is exactly the tactic an abuser would use, growing a large church in order to hide? And what do we need to be more alert about in order to be safe and prevent abuse in these scenarios? I think part of it, you know, can be seen through the lens of, of Goffman's, you know, dramaturgical theory. And and he at one point talks about the ways in which self-promoting language is, is, is used and how people will volunteer information about themselves. And they'll do more of that if, if they know that, that there's there's something about who they really are that is different than what other people expect them to be. So the more that that gap exists between how people see them and who they really are, the more the more they feel the need to volunteer information about themselves in order to maintain in 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 image. And you know, I I think that um, when when we when we see that happening, um, it. I, I lost track of your question, Lori. I'm so sorry. So <laughs> no, I remember okay. the question. I, I was going somewhere and I'm thinking, yeah, hey, it's a, I'm so sorry. No, I do the same thing. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so the best place to hide for an abuser would be a place least likely to be searched. So why are we, yes, yes, that's um, right. you know, right. got it. Right. Yes. Got it now. Okay. So um, I think <laughs> <clears throat> when, when somebody rec- when somebody who's trying to do that is trying to create this image of themselves in order maybe to hide something that is true about them, then they might identify a church or a position of trust, a, a public-facing role as, as the perfect role in order to occupy, to, to hide. Um, and it may be something that they want to hide from themselves, uh, not just something that they want to hide from other people. Uh, so I've talked to people who were uh, seeking out some kind of pastor role and in asking them, you know, why do you want to do this? I've, I've heard some troubling answers over time, you know, answers like, well, I've just never really been respected. And, and, and I just think if I were in this kind of role, people would respect me. Or somebody told me once, you know, some, someone said this to me, you know, hey, you know, someone told me once that, um, I will never be able to um, um, accomplish, you know, whatever it is, right? So they set out to prove that person wrong, and they thought that being a pastor would be a way in which to prove these other people in their life wrong, right? So the position, the role, um, and the, the, the trust that, that, 
that that comes with and the the kind of the sacredness that that comes with can be attractive to people who want to find an an image right that they can then present to other people as a way of 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 hiding does that make sense yeah <clears throat> so i think a church and a that and does a make pastor sense kind of becomes one of those one of those possible roles that somebody who is who is already um in you know already abusive and is already engaging in these patterns of deception might seek to occupy yeah unfortunately something good that is easily preyed upon and um and can easily hurt many people which is a hard hard truth that we have to face <clears throat> I have this one last question for you, and then um, we're going to save another one for our Patreon supporters. But <clears throat> if you could point to somebody who is maybe looking for resources, they've walked through abuse, and they're wanting resources both to learn from. So it's a two-part question. What resources would you point them to? And then how also do you advise people to engage with people who are still in that system but don't quite see it? Um, cause that can be one of the harder parts. So one would be the resource aspect. And then the other is how do you advise them to interact with people who are still complicit in the environment? Yeah. And I, and I guess the answer to both is, is sort of the same. It's, it's through education and through resources often that our eyes are open and we begin to see what we uh, couldn't see before. And with that, you know, comes so many other gifts and I, I really have benefited from the work of Dr. Diane Lingberg, um, not only her recent book, Redeeming Power, um, but her book, Suffering in the Heart of God, and her YouTube lectures, and she has many. Uh, she talks about narcissism and the systems it breeds, and one of her older YouTube uh, lectures that I, that I found to be really helpful um, and encourage people to watch so that, you know, so she would be one, one voice. Uh, Chuck DeGroat has written um, a lot about narcissism in churches and also has great things to say, I think, about spiritual abuse and psychological and emotional abuse. Um, and then along those lines, you know, just thinking about psychological and emotional abuse and understanding that spiritual abuse, or at least the way that I understand it, is a, is a type of psychological abuse i think it's helpful to to gain some understanding just about the psychological and emotional abuse in general and one of the books that i found to be be helpful um, is called stalking the soul um, and it's an older book i think it was written in the 1990s by marie france and i can't remember her her, her last name but if you Google the title of the book, it, it should come up. But that's a book about em, emotional yeah. abuse and the erosion of identity. Um, and there's books on verbal abuse as well. And uh, the verbally abusive relationship is one. And that's, I think, helpful because the way in which spiritual abuse kind of manifests itself is so often verbally. Um, and so I think there's a lot of overlap between verbally abusive relationships and the spiritually abusive context. Blind betrayal. Great. Thank you so much. We'll yeah. link those. Oh, sorry, another one? Yeah. Oh, Blind Betrayal uh, by Jennifer Fry. Blind Betrayal. And all of her work on um, betrayal, blindness, I, I think is helpful because betrayal is such an important concept. And yes. then as it relates to... Kind betrayal, of, blindness is real. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And then as it relates to, you know, helping other people who are kind of in, in this system, um, I, one tip that I would give is sometimes it's, it's hard to go directly to people, especially if you are in that system or still are, and to tell them what you know to be true or what you experienced, because they might have been told by leadership or they might um, come to this conclusion themselves that, well, you know, you know, this person just 
is is jaded or they're bitter or they just aren't seeing things correctly they're too close to this the 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 situation whatever it might be it's easy for them to discredit you but if you say hey you know here's a here's a talk um on youtube that i think you should watch you don't have to agree with it um but i just think it would be helpful if you watched it because if 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 somebody watches or reads content from another person who's completely separate from that situation and they and what that person is describing resonates with them then that can be um that that can be eye opening so that's one way in which you might be able to communicate to those who are already in a system and maybe they don't want to that maybe they aren't listening to you directly, but perhaps they'd be open to another voice. That's really good advice. And it resonates <laughs> when you've been discredited. It's so easy to discredit a whistleblower when silencing has been such a part of your technique already. Um, mm-hmm. It's pretty easy to say that person is disgruntled or bitter and people believe them. I know I did when I first came into my job. There were people that were described that way and I believed it wholeheartedly and didn't want to hear their story. It's a pretty magic way to discredit a whistleblower but um sending them a youtube video is a really great idea are there any that you would recommend offhand um so diane diane langberg's you know youtube videos on narcissism and churches i think it's helpful because often what people are in is a narcissistic system and so i think it's helpful to see her you know describe the the uh, the symptoms of a narcissistic sim- uh, system, you know, and, and 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 what that what that looks like. Um, so that that would be helpful. And then there's a lot of like podcasts and and YouTube lectures that are um, podcasts and lectures that are available on on on, on YouTube. So even Chuck DeGroat's kind of work is on is on YouTube as well. Um, let me think if there's anything else. You know, another one. Um, that I would recommend. Um, her name is uh, is escaping me, um, but she wrote the book "Is Nothing Sacred." Um, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, her her name's escaping me. Um, okay. Marie Fortune, Doctor Marie Fortune. We'll look it up. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah, we'll definitely link all that in the show notes. We had Chuck DeGroat and Diane Lamberg on the show, and oh, so helpful for me. Yeah, I would say your book, their her book, Redeeming Power, his book, When Narcissism Comes to Church, and then Scott McKnight and Laura Berenger, who were on the podcast too, oh, yeah. A Church Called Tobe. Those were the four that, I, that just impacted me so greatly and I've recommended to a lot of people. We'll link all that in the show notes for those of you who haven't heard of any of this, and this is the first time. But thank you so much for being on today. If you're a Patreon supporter, we're going to, ask him one other question. Um, and so join us there if you're a Patreon supporter, but just thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. Let us know where we can find you for those who want to follow and get your newsletter and all that. Yeah. Thanks, Lori. Um, I have a website, wadetmullen.com. And so people can you know find me there. And then I have a Twitter uh, handle, I think is Wade Mullen, just my name. And Sometimes I'm on Facebook and Instagram, so I do have accounts there as well. Um, but I've been on a bit of a hiatus from social media for, for, for some time now. Um, but I have content on there if people would like to explore further. Thank you so much for being on. This has just been such a wealth of information. Thank you for all your hard work, for the price you pay to just hear the stories and process your own story over and over again. We're just so grateful to have you on, Wade. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Lori. So, yes, once again, Dr. Wade Mullen, I I don't know how this one hit you this time, if it's your second time hearing it or if it's your first, um, or particularly if this is your first time hearing Dr. Wade Mullen at all. Um, wow, some of his wording has been so formulated over just researching so many situations of image threatening events in faith based spaces where abuse has occurred and you know I just want to camp out here as we wrap this up and process it a little bit is you know what struck me again listening to it this time is 
you know, the reasons people stay silent when he was kind of addressing that. And we see this happen quite a bit where people will either um, be a part of watching the abuse happen or know that it happened or hear the story from the survivor and um, and for whatever reason be just silent in the in the wake of an event like this when there would be an opportunity otherwise to speak up. And as he said, there's many reasons for that that Irving Goffman goes into in his writing, but you know, it could be that they're sincerely converted to the system and they just wholeheartedly believe this is a good place. No matter what people say, no abuse happens here and just sort of following the script. Um, or, you know, people just choose to remain quiet and there can be a variety of reasons for that. Some very understandable reasons, um, you know, but as Wade mentioned Often it's because they have been silenced, and that can take various forms. It could be that it's just the oxygen you breathe. You just know that you shouldn't speak out. It could be seeing many people with a high attrition rate on the staff and in the church itself leave, and then when people leave, watching them be shunned or hearing them be discredited in either big or small ways. And so just intuitively knowing I don't want to be that person. Also, maybe they've been told by the one who abuses if they gossip, they'll get fired or whatever. And so just a fear. There's a lot of fear around speaking out. So some of it is, you know, very understandable. But as he mentioned, if someone has authority to, uh, in the situation where they're a board member, another staff member has a level of authority of some kind or proximity to the accused, um, this could be friends of the one who is abused. It could be, um, you know, their mega church pastor friends and their kind of bro club or whatever um, people they speak on stages with at you know church conferences for example that they share some sort of relationship with these are all people who have proximity to the accused that also may be silent in these situations and we see this happen quite a bit and um, you know the standing by and staying, staying silent as Wade mentioned it could be for a variety of reasons it could be because they choose not to believe the story of abuse it could be to protect themselves. Uh, it could be to enable the abuse because they benefit in some way, as he mentioned. You know, loyalty can be rewarded in these scenarios with leaders who are really, you know, kind of running a tight ship or um, keeping, you know, the narrative in their control. And so there, there can these loyalty cultures also reward those who stay silent. And that could be especially on a staff where there's a high attrition rate, that could mean a promotion. It could be more salary, higher position, more stage time. It could be all kinds of things. Um, it could just be, you know, their reputation. Their, it's, you know, obviously lots of fears around what will people say about me if I say something in favor of the person who was abused. Um, it could just be they want more access to power for a variety of reasons. And then it could also just be that, you know, they benefit from this abuse occurring because the church may be growing because of a toxic leader, a toxic rock star of sorts. And when the church is getting more people, that just feels really good. When you're on staff, it makes you feel better about yourself. It's, you know, these are all many reasons that people stay silent, these silent bystanders, as they're referred to. And I think it's important to camp out here because I myself have been a silent bystander in more than one situation, even the situation in which I was in a church where I was later abused. There were things that were not quite right that I didn't understand until later and I had to go make amends. But in the middle of it, I was confused and silent when I could have said more. And that's been my own work I've had to work through to make amends with those individuals who were whistleblowing to me. And I I, you know, I chose not to believe it because I was afraid I would be fired for gossiping if I listened to it. Uh, but it doesn't excuse that I did that. And I have gone, like I said, and made amends with those individuals. But, you know, I think I want to camp out here at the end on the silent bystander. And from the perspective of survivors, I think it's really important to listen to this. He mentioned it in this section. What silent bystanders communicate to survivors is one of two things. One is, we don't believe you. And the second one could be, your story really doesn't matter. And I just want to let us sit with that as we close. And if that's something that you're convicted about, something that you need to make amends with someone about, 
or something that calls you to action in some way, then I just want us to be aware that our silence in a situation, as, as Wade said, that's what gives evil what it needs to thrive. And so if you are in a position of authority or have proximity to someone who has been accused, there are situations where that may not be safe for you to, to say anything, but in many situations, many, many, many situations, you do have an opportunity to say something and to tell that survivor, I believe you and your story does matter. So we can be a part of reversing that tide, going against it, doing the hard thing, being brave on behalf of someone who has really been silenced and discredited and lost their community at times, oftentimes. And if you're still a part of it or are wanting to, you know, maybe leave in a way that's like leaving loudly, someone in our situation in November published an open letter and when we had never met this person and said, I believe Lauren Jason Adams Brown and just tagged us on Twitter because they had seen that same pattern. Those kind of things mean a great deal to survivors. So if you're in a position to do that, to not be silent anymore and that you're speaking out would be of great benefit to those survivors who have been unheard, unseen and cast out. Um, yeah, just want us to think about that as we revisit this episode. Once again, Dr. Wade Mullen has really used his academic career and his ministry to help bless survivors, to help churches be places of truth and transparency and accountability so that all can be safe to worship freely in those places. And so our part in the system is to use our voice and our privilege and our power for good, to redeem it, as Dr. Diane Lineberg would say, redeeming our power. So as we sit with that here at the end, that question of being a silent bystander. What do we want to say to survivors? We want to say we believe you and your story does matter. I would love to know if that's something you're feeling led to do or have recently done or are contemplating doing so we can pray for you. In the meantime, so glad to bring this episode to you once again in Spiritual Abuse Awareness Month here in January as a rebroadcast from one of our most downloaded episodes last year for a very, very, very good reason. Everybody out there all around the world, thank you for making a difference wherever you are. We make a difference in the best ways when we do it together in our little parts of the world. As we let each other know about what we're doing, it can really be inspiring and inspire us to be courageous wherever we are. So we love hearing about the differences that you're making, especially in the area of speaking up about abuse wherever you are. Let us know. In the meantime, take care, everyone. Be safe. Bye-bye. As we're finishing this episode, if you're thinking, I really wish I could learn more or go a little bit deeper, well, that's what our Difference Maker community is for. I would love to welcome you in to join the rest of us there. Once again, um, it's only $5 a month to join the price of a latte at your local coffee shop. You can join at our Changers tier. Difference Makers is a community that really means so much to me. It's very special because each time I have a guest on the show, I record something um, outside of what we give to just the regular podcast audience where we go a little bit deeper and then I post those video episodes in this community and we can discuss them. But also at the very uh, beginning tier, which is our changers tier of this community, you'll get exclusive voting power and help pick podcast topics that give us you know, more of what we want from your perspective. You'll have access to exclusive um, 30 plus mini-sodes that aren't out there for the general public. And you'll get every month an exclusive monthly bonus mini-sode. At our Groundbreakers level, which is $10 a month, you can join and get all of that, but also priority access to submit questions to the podcast. And you'll get an additional two exclusive monthly bonus mini-sodes. And at our Trailblazers tier, which is $15 a month, the price of three lattes a month, um, you can get all of that plus also three exclusive monthly bonus minisodes um, and a patron shout out. So I would love for you to join us at any of those tiers. Um, it'll help you come into this community, be in the midst of all of us, other difference makers, and we'd love to hear your perspective. I certainly would. It's a place to engage more with me and the audience around what you like, what you're resonating with, and once again, go deeper with each of our guests. So 
please join us in this membership community. I would love to hear your perspective and love to share this extra content with you. So show up at patreon.com slash a world of difference.